The fourth major error is that our assurance of salvation rests solely on Christ's imputed righteousness, therefore, commandment keeping is impossible. Again, there isn't one scripture in the Bible that supports that idea. In Matthew 1, 21, we learn that an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him, Mary's going to have a baby. And you're to call his name Jesus because he will, what? Save his people from what? From their sin condition. The word sin there is being used as an adjective, not as a verb. In Romans chapter 6, the word sin is used 17 times. 16 times as an adjective. Speaking of the sin condition, only once as a verb, establishing clearly from Scripture that Jesus has saved us from the power and slavery of the sin condition. In John 15, 14, and in John 8, 11, Jesus heals two people from physical and moral conditions. And then he says to them, quote, Go and sin no more. The word sin is being used there by Jesus as a verb. Jesus then says to all of us in Revelation 3.21, I'll quote it to you. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. End quote. Sounds like overcoming. Is possible. Amen. Amen. As to whether commandment keeping is possible, we learn in 1 John 5 3, I'll read it to you. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. End quote. Would, I, would God ask you to do something that he knew you were not able to? The fifth major error being taught today in our denomination is that Ellen G. White's writings are not trustworthy and should not be used as doctrinal authority. Throughout 6,000 years of recorded history, God has always chosen a person through whom He could communicate directly with His people. Even in extreme circumstances, like when Judah was about to be invaded and annihilated by their enemies, we learn from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20, and I'll quote it to you. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. In our time, God has anticipated our needs and the direction he wants us to follow. By giving the Seventh-day Adventist Church a very special gift. He then inspired John the Revelator to record in Revelation 12, 17 and in Revelation 19, 10, what was this very special gift? Paul calls it. John records it in Revelation 12, 17 as the testimony of Jesus. And in Revelation 19, 10, as the spirit of prophecy. The physical, circumstantial, and scriptural evidence that E.G. White was God's chosen messenger for the end time church has been overwhelmingly and repeatedly confirmed. Amen. And if you have any questions about actual circumstantial situations, let me share a couple of them with you. A very famous preacher made some statements at a huge Seventh-day Adventist congregation in Battle Creek, Michigan. The very next day, he received a letter from Ellen G. White in Australia. In those days, it took between three and four months to send a letter from Australia to the United States. 
God impressed her to send a letter to this man four months before he made the statement that he did the day before. When he read the letter, he broke down crying and he shared that letter with the same congregation the next time. Amen. One of the most incredible visions that I've ever read her, read that she had, was known as the Salamanca vision. A vision that God gave to her in seconds. It took about four to five months to give her that vision. And every time she tried to repeat the vision for the first time, she'd forget it. She couldn't recall it. Then approximately four to five months later, he woke her up around three o'clock one morning and completed the last part of the vision. She was supposed to not attend a meeting that morning, which began at 5.30. But she showed up. And the president of the general conference said, Ellen, welcome. I didn't know you were coming. And she says, I didn't either. <laughs> then she got up and related the vision which over four months she kept forgetting every time she would try to repeat the segment of the vision. She repeated the vision in such detail that several people <coughs> in the congregation broke down crying. And one by one they stood up and confessed that they were the ones that had said word for word what she had just repeated a moment ago. And one of them said, last night. And she said, last night? Last night? And the man said, yes, last night. I'm the one who made that statement that you just quoted word for word. So God began giving her vision five months previously of what was going to have happen a few hours before. Read it for yourself. There is no other Christian denomination that can give scriptural and circumstantial evidence of having received the gift of prophecy, which scripture says God will give the end time church. There is no eighth church. This is it. This is the seventh. This October 22 marks the 174th year of our failure to understand the divine appointment God raised this movement to accomplish. We have been deceived by accepting popular evangelical teachings in order to be accepted by other Christian denomination. In so doing, we have become blind to the basic errors inherent in nearly all of their teachings. Errors which we are now being taught in all of our schools. A Seventh-day Adventist, we have been content to stand by and watch history unfold. In fact, we, can take, we take great pleasure in recognizing all of the signs that the Bible talks about as far as events. Whether it's being dealing with nature, politics, wars, or the anticipation of the Sunday laws being passed. We love it. And we feel very good about it. And we brag about it. These events may be important. But they do not address the issues that determine the final outcome of the dragon's war with the remnant of proceeding. Each passing year should make it more obvious that the events of the end are, a mine, are of minor importance compared with the issues of the end. Isn't it past time for us to recognize that the final events are contingent upon the issues being clearly identified and corrected? Do you believe that the distinct biblical truths upon which God raised this church provide clear evidence to the world between truth and error? 
Are you ready to let Christ clothe you with His righteousness and prepare you for the final war between the dragon and the remnant of her seed? That's a personal decision that each one of us must make. God bless you. Our closing hymn is number 606. It's a new song, maybe, for some of you. But it has an incredible message. 100% consistent with what we have studied today. Amen. Thank you. Let us stand. And instead of seeing this, Chuck had mentioned how important the words and the message is to this song. So I will read the first and third lines, and together we will read the second and fourth. Once to every man and nation. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth and falsehood for the good or evil side. Some great cause, God's new Messiah, Offering each the bloom or blight, and the choice goes by forever twixt the darkness and the light. Then to side with truth is noble when we share her wretched crust, ere her cause bring fame and profit, and tis prosperous to be just. Then it is the brave man chooses while a coward stands aside, till the multitude make virtue of the faith they had denied. By the light of burning martyrs, Christ, thy bleeding feet we track. Ere her cause bring fame and profit, oh, I'm sorry, toiling up new Calvaries ever, with a cross that turns not back. New occasions teach new duties, Time makes ancient good uncouth. They must upward still and onward, who would keep abreast of truth. Though the curse of evil prosper, yet tis truth alone is strong. Though her portion be the scaffold, and upon the throne be wrong, yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown. Standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. Loving Father, thank you for the privilege of meeting here under these favorable circumstances now. Amen. To study your word, to recognize the responsibility that each of us has. To make a decision as to whether we are going to follow cunningly devised fables or if we're going to follow the clear word that you have inspired to be recorded for each one of us, especially that end church that will bring about Jesus' second coming. Amen. We pray that each of us will recognize that there is a cosmic conflict that needs to be solved. And that it is our privilege to cooperate with you and Jesus' ministry in the heavenly sanctuary in fitting us not only to, rep, to glorify your name in each of our lives, but to fit us for eternity. We thank you for answering these requests and to speak it to each of our hearts because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.